Well, how are we? We got some rain this week, and uh, we got Labor Day tomorrow, which is known for for you that have moved here in the last uh, year or so. Labor Day always is uh, flood day around here, so please be careful out there. Isn't it amazing that it just Labor Day just kind of brings that on? But uh, man, it's great to see you. It really is. Uh, 1958, the World Series was, was between the Yankees and the Braves. And I, I want to show you a picture right quick. Uh, this is Yogi Berra catching and Hank Aaron that is swinging. 1958 World Series. Now, Yogi Berra was the catcher for the Yankees, and he was notorious for uh, talking behind the plate, and he would, he would try to distract the hitter. And so he would do uh, whatever he could uh, to distract the hitter, whatever he may say. Well, Hank Aaron came up to bat, and uh, uh, Yogi Berra decided to try to throw him off. So uh, what he would say is, hey, Hank, your, uh, your brand you, on your bat, you can't read it. You're going to swing you're gonna uh, you're gonna crack your bat if if you swing because you can't read the brand. Well, Hank Aaron didn't listen to him, and the pitch comes. Hank Aaron hits it out of the ballpark, and uh, he rounds the base uh, bases, rounds third base, and comes and steps on home. And he says to Yogi, he says, "Yogi, I didn't come up here to read. I came up here to hit." And uh, so Yogi Berra thought he was distracting him, and many, many players would have been distracted, but Hank Aaron, because of who he is, he didn't come up there to read. He came up there and hit the ball. Distractions are part of life. Um, I, I think we recognize evil a lot of time, but sometimes just distractions just lose, we lose our focus. Uh, you know, when we got involved with the war in Iraq, they were looking for WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. We have today weapons of mass distraction that keep us from focusing on where God would have us be. And we are going to be looking at this. You know, we talked about in the month of August, we talked about going against the culture, our culture just as coming against us. And, and this month, we want to talk about how the distractions take our eyes on focusing on what God has for us. So if you have our Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the letter of James. The letter of James is towards the end of the New Testament. You may be uh, new to the Scriptures. You got... Um, in the New Testament, you have certain letters that are called general letters or general epistles, that means they were written for a large group of people. They weren't specifically so much just for a particular church. They were general. They were to a large group of people. And we're going to be reading James 1, 1 through 8 in just a moment. Um, but I want to tell you some background of the letter of James, okay? James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, James. Um, can you imagine being the half-brother of Jesus? We say half-brother because obviously Jesus, uh, his mother was Mary, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph and Mary went on with their life, right? Uh, they didn't end with just Jesus. And so they had other children, and James was one of those children. Now, James, um, how many of you had older siblings in the room? Okay, I, had a, I have an older brother, he's four years older, and I, I can just about imagine um, when, when I showed up in the class that my brother had been in three years previously, um, they were probably thinking, man, I hope he's like his brother. I hope he's like his brother. And, and can you imagine Mary or Joseph disciplining James and saying, why aren't you more like your brother Jesus? 
I would respond back <clears throat> by saying, why aren't you more like my brother, Jesus? <laughs> but it had to be a difficult thing. You know, <clears throat> there was a time when they thought Jesus had lost it because they had come to take him home because they thought he had, had lost it. But here's James, the half-brother of Jesus, and what has happened is, is these, the letter of James was written, it was probably one of the earliest, uh, 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 earliest things we have that's in the New Testament. And what has happened is, there was another James, you remember James and John, they were uh, uh, disciples of Jesus. James has been beheaded, okay? That James. And James, this James, is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But what has happened is, is because that James was beheaded, Christians just start dispersing. They're leaving from Jerusalem. They're going back to their home areas. They're going back to wherever the persecution is not. And so these are the Christians that he's writing to. And he's writing for a couple of reasons. One, he's he, he writing to encourage. We, we see that. We, we know that the encouragement. He's also writing to them to uh, act, act accordingly, to live out their faith. But number three, this is the overarching theme of the letter of James. Grow up. Grow up. Grow up in your faith. Uh, it's not the time to whine. It's not the time to uh, just go about your business as usual. It's time to grow up in the faith. And so keep that in mind because we're going to be looking through this letter over the next month. And we're going to be seeing how that the, the focus so often gets lost. And in our day, it's that way. We kind of have... Uh, spiritual ADD, you know, we're, we're following Christ, and then the first thing that comes into our mind, we're focused on that. Now, we're focused over here and focused over here. Instead of keeping our focus and our gaze on Christ and what God's intent for us, we have a tendency to gaze at things around us and then glance at God. And there's a difference. So we're going to look at this today, and we're beginning in James 1, 1 through 8, so uh, you can follow along. I, I always encourage you to uh, just take notes. It, it, the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory, so hang on to that. Here we go. Verse 1. James, a servant or bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. There you go. That's the one they've been dispersed among uh, the different lands. And then he says, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways double-minded man unstable in all his ways when these distractions in life come to you the tendency is to focus all of our attention on the uh on what is happening over here instead of focusing on god and we become double-minded and we become ineffective so what do distractions do well from what we understand, they take our eyes off our major focus. They frustrate us, don't they? I mean, when distractions come, they steal energy in you, and then they create doubt. Now, the distraction we're going to focus on today is what 
James calls trials. What he calls trials. Let me define trials for you because everybody in this room is either in a trial or you've come out of a trial or, I hate to say this, you're about to enter a trial. Because life is full of trials. But here, here's how I want to give a working definition of a trial. It's a hardship directed towards a desired end. In other words, there's a purpose for a trial. It's a hardship directed towards a desired end. And, and this is the way I, I look at it too. It's a tool God uses to mature you. Are all trials caused by God? No, he does cause some. Some trials are just because of our ignorance. We just walk into them ourselves. But I tell you this, God will allow trials, and he may cause trials, but the reason he is going to allow it or cause it is to mature you, to grow you up. So don't think it's to destroy you. A temptation comes from the enemy to destroy you. But a trial comes and is allowed by God to develop you and to mature you. Hang on to that. Because some of you are saying, okay, Mark, this is a struggle area for me. The New Testament believers, they made high impact in the lives of people that were not followers of Jesus by the way they dealt with trials. I look at today. We talked about our culture last month. We talked about our culture coming against us. We look at our culture. We look at things that are going on around us. The trials that there, you know, we can always look back of two years of, of pandemic and the trial of that. We saw the trial of economy right now how are we gonna uh how is this gonna come out we uh we also have the trials of health issues that are there but i've seen people deal with trials different and i want to say this this is not just the world i've seen believers christ followers respond with some of these same responses so what are some of the responses to trials Depression. Coming out of COVID, they say that depression has just escalated. And uh, we see that many people deal with trials by woe is me and, and the depression comes in. Blame. We want to blame others for the trials that we are under. Denial. I can't believe that this is really happening. We pinch ourselves. We say, oh, I'm going to wake up and the trial is going to be gone. But it's not. Anger. Some people just get angry with others and the trial they're going through. Here's one of my number one responses, whining. Uh, you know, we whine. Uh, when I was in doing student ministry, I had a pen that had whining on it with a line through it. It didn't do any good, but it made me feel better uh, because whining is just what happens and, and we whine. And I, I say... Trials are to make us fine wine, not to make us whiners. And we become whiners so often. Here's another response. I see people get bitter. Instead of getting better, they get bitter. And, and, uh, and it's a struggle in their heart. They carry the weight of that bitterness. Here's another response to trials. People escape, escapism. They they try to escape. They try to run from. They run to fantasy world. They run to social media. They run to um, uh, areas of pornography, or they run to uh, pleasure, and they run to these different things, trying to escape. But it's not always negative uh, responses that people have to uh, to trials. I've seen people become hopeful. I've, be, I've seen people become joyful. I've seen people uh, turn and become uh, more dependent on, upon God. But that is what I see people responding. And I don't know your go-to and how you respond. 
uh, you, may, you may be facing an extra special trial right now, and your response has not been uh, the way you would want it. The way I look at it so often is trials squeeze you, and you don't know what's inside of you until you're squeezed. You know, we think we got it all together and, oh, how godly am I? Look at me. I read my Bible for a week in a row now and I've been to church. I've done all these things. And then the trial comes. And then all of a sudden, what comes out? You're thinking, oh, I didn't know that was in there. And that's what comes out. But I want to give you four positive results of trials looking at the text that we are going through. The first one is this, trials purge, trials purge. Uh, purging is you try to get rid of something. When you're sick, your body will purge. It will sweat. It will, you may get an upset stomach and you're, you will empty out what's in your stomach through throwing up. These are purges that happen to get the evil, get the, uh, what is wrong out of your body. Well, trials come and they help purge you of the self that keeps getting in the way. It's, that, it's the, the way to get self out of the way. It, you become more dependent upon a God. Let me give you an example. Some of you in this room have gone through a downsizing or where they're cutting back for your work and you've gone through that and they come and they call you to HR and they say, Listen, we're cutting back. You're, you're no longer going to have a job here. Well, the panic sets in, right? You're thinking, how are we going to make it through this thing? And, and you go home. You tell your spouse, they're cutting back. Uh, uh, we no longer have a job here. And, and what happens is, yes, you, there's initial panic. And then what happens after that? You start seeking the Father. You start going before the Lord and, God, I, I, I am humbled here. I cry out to you. Well, think about it. Think about it. That trial is purging you of self and drawing you closer to the one that created you. You see how that trial has worked in your life? And, and, and I know you're thinking, but I'm still without a job. Listen. God is going to provide. He's obligated himself. I read the word. He's obligated himself to take care of his children. And, and that trial has been used, or God has allowed that trial to bring you close to him. Um, you know, a mugger and a surgeon have other things, have things in common. Uh, Jim Rowan said earlier, yeah, a mugger and a surgeon take your money. But, uh, but a mugger and a surgeon both use knives. A mugger is using a knife to hurt you, to take from you. A surgeon is using a pinpoint scalpel to cut with purpose so he can bring healing to you. I want you to know that we have a God that uses trials just like a surgeon to remove those, maybe that cancerous part that's there. And many of you have had cancer, and they get to clear margins, right? And they want to get to clear margins. And sometimes the only way that can happen is to cut more and to cut more. But if there's a purpose behind that. I want you to know that God uses trials to purchase, purge us and to grow us up, okay? The second thing about trials is trials perfect you know Jesus even said you must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect perfect in the scriptures means completely mature whole okay it's not divided it's completely mature and what God does is he used trials to perfect us now the faith walk in life is not easy I think sometimes we miss it with people and we explain the gospel to them. And the good news is we are sinners. We're separated from a holy God because of sin nature in us. 
and we are sinners. But yet, what God did is He sent Jesus to become sin, the perfect Redeemer, the perfect Lamb of God. He was crucified on the cross, and He rose from the dead. And anyone that acknowledges Him as Lord, that you come to that great exchange of saying, God, I give you my unrighteousness for your righteousness. It's not an even trade, but you said I can do that. So, God, you demonstrated your love for me, and that while I was sinful, you gave your life for me. So that's the good news. That Everybody on the planet needs to hear that good news, that God loves them and has redeemed them. But what happens so often is that we see that, that faith, we don't go the step further in saying that your faith now in Jesus Christ, there's going to be a world and a culture that you're going to fight. And welcome to the battle. We don't tell people that. And sometimes when they, they come to Christ and there's that euphoric joy of the release of their sin, they feel washed and they feel clean. And then they go out there in their world and they get hit in the face and they're thinking, what is going on? Because the, the faith life is hard. But we have a God who loves us so much. He is perfecting us and He is... It's like this. Many of you work with wood here. You may work with wood for a living or it's a hobby. But when you have a piece of wood and it has splinters on it or it has rough edges, what you do is you take the sandpaper and you get rid of those splinters. You get rid of those rough edges. Why? So that you can use it. And that's what God is doing through trials. He is allowing that trial or, or he maybe has caused that trial for to take sandpaper to you and to smooth you out. And life is a process, right? It's not a journey. It's not a sprint. You're going to be going through the process of life, and you're going to be journeying. And, and we don't know how long that is. It, for, for some, it may be longer than others, but God is always at work. Many of you know the, the, the story or have read about smelters who take uh, silver and they put it in the uh, they put it in a, a, a pan or they put it in, in some kind of bowl and they cut the fire up and they're wanting to purify their silver and so what happens is it's through the heat what happens is is the dross which is the impurities in the silver the the dirt whatever is in the silver it rises to the top, so you skim that off and put it aside, and then you cut it up again, and you, the dross comes you because you're completely refining that silver. And it's been asked of the smelter, when do you know that the silver is finished? And the comment is, when I can see my reflection in the silver, then I know that the dross is gone. And you see, what God loves us so much, and we, we don't like this so often, he cuts up the heat to, to take that because he is preparing us so that he can see his image in us. Isn't that good? That's what he's doing. The third thing about trials is trials prepare. Pr trials prepare you. What God is doing, He has purpose for you, He loves you, He is preparing you to be used of Him, and hear me, it's to give Him glory. Now, you may be thinking, well, God's a megalomaniac if He just created us for, for His glory alone. Let me tell you something, we find our purpose for existing when we give Him glory. And so, He is preparing us. And preparation takes time. If you are uh, doing a recipe, it takes time to get that recipe perfect with what you're preparing. And, you know, school has just started back up. We're a couple of weeks into school. But, you know, I, I would drive up here uh, to my office before school started, and I would hear the band across the street, and school's not going on. I knew the football team was uh, practicing over there. I know that at Round Rock Christian, the football team was out there. 
The volleyball team was in here, and they haven't even started classes yet. And you're thinking, man, why, what are they doing? They're preparing for the season. They're not waiting for the first game and say, oh, let's see who we can get together to have a game. We are preparing ahead of time, and that's what God is, is doing with us. He is preparing us ahead of time for what may be the next step he has for it. I love 2 Corinthians. I just finished it again. But 2 Corinthians talks about how that we go through certain trials, we go through certain things, so that in time we can help others that are going through the same thing. Don't you love to talk to somebody who's gone through what you're going through so they can help coach you through it? And what God does is He uses what happens to you to minister to somebody else on down the, the, the way. And so trials prepare you for the next step in life. So they purge, they perfect, they prepare one more. Trials produce. Trials produce. Notice what the text says. It says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, your uh, scriptures may say patience or endurance. Do not pray for patience. Some of you have prayed for patience before, and God gave you a child that is hyperactive, and uh, you, you, well, I was going to say, you know why certain animals eat their young. <laughs> because you may have gotten... And you prayed for patience, and God gave you someone that's going to teach you patience, and uh, you prayed for the patience. Do not pray for patience. God will produce that patience in you, and it will come through trials. Um, but let me tell you, He's going to produce true, lasting fruit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is going to be evident. You know, you don't take anything with you when you go out of here you you and he, but the things he produce are eternal he produces that and and the word steadfastness it was interesting to look at the what the word yeah we get the word patience the word endurance but it's it literally means it turns something into good it turns something into glory so what God does it, through trials, He's producing a good thing in you. A good thing. So don't think it's a punishment. It's a good thing. And then what happens through that steadfastness is you get stability in your life and then wisdom in your life. And, and you're thinking, okay, I need wisdom. And most of you have some form of wisdom. And... and and James says, if you, anyone lacks wisdom, ask of God who gives abundantly. And, uh, but I've learned this. Just like patience, I've learned the most wisdom in during trials and, you ready for this? Failing. Failure is not an excuse to give up. Failure is a time to get up and learn from what you've gone through so that you can go forward with God. I, I used to have this feeling that when I failed, God was angry with me. I, you know, I missed that opportunity. I should have prayed with him. I should have shared the good news with him. I, I should have done that. And so you beat yourself up. And then I, I started uh, understanding the scriptures teach that because of God's grace, yes, he has an opportunity, he has a divine appointment for me, and if I miss it, his conviction is not to sideline me, his conviction is so maybe the next time we'll get it right. See the difference? It, we don't have a God who's wanting to put us in time out. We have a God that wants us to flourish. And he is, he is producing this in our life. There was a, a father 
who had twin sons. One of them was super pessimistic. The other one was super optimistic. The father thought, surely these boys can balance each other out. The pessimist needs to be, become more optimistic. And the optimistic kid, we need to pull his chain a little bit back this way. And so he's thinking, what can I do? So he decides to do this. For the pessimistic kid, he buys him a new bike, new toys, just fills his room with, with all kinds of new stuff. And uh, for the uh, optimistic kid, who's always optimistic, he said, well, this is what I'm going to do. He pile, put a, a pile of manure in his room. So he goes and checks on the pessimistic kid, and he's complaining. Toys are already broke. He's, they've lost their uh, thrill already, and he's asking for more stuff. And uh, that's the pessimistic kid. He thought, well, I failed there. So he goes to the optimistic kid. And the, this kid has taken a shovel, and he's digging into the manure. And he says, boy, what are you doing? He said, Dad, if all this manure here, there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> now, the way, the way we approach trials, I'm not saying we're digging in the manure, but I'm telling you, God can use manure for His glory. He can use the trials. He's producing something in you. So, so what? Let me wrap this up. Trials are part of living. I wish I could say they aren't. You that are in a trial right now, my heart goes out to you. Uh, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, relational, financial, whatever it may be, that trial is very personal to you. But trials are part of living. Pr trials are to grow you up. They're not to destroy you. You know, whatever you're going through is not to destroy you. I, and sometimes, uh, just a thought, sometimes people turn to whining and they say, why me? Why am, why am I going through this? Why, why me? And, and you know, the Lord has taught me because we live in a fallen planet, to say, why not me? I mean, God, if you need a believer to go through that, then so be it. So, it, But it's a time to grow up. And then trials come so that God may be glorified. God sees beyond the storm. He sees beyond the storm. Uh, I have in my pocket um, just a penny. And uh, this penny is the smallest... Uh, uh, not physical coin, but the, the cheapest coin we have, a penny. And uh, when I look at the guys back in the um, room, uh, sound room back there, I can take this penny and I can put it close enough to my eye that I cannot see them at all. In fact, all I can see is this penny right in front of me. And this penny is so small. But if I push the penny off... Then I can see the guys. I can see what's going on around me. Case in point here. Often we take our trials and we let it have all of our focus and it's right here. And it's all we can see. And God is saying, let's get a new perspective. Yes, you're going through a trial, but understand I am at work in this trial. So let's get a right perspective. Let's glance at it knowing that it's going on, but let's let our focus be out here instead of bringing it right here. That's the way the Scriptures teach about trials. I end with this. Michelangelo, the great sculptor and painter of the Sistine Chapel, he was staring at a piece of marble. And uh, he was just staring at that piece of marble and somebody came up to him and asked, said, what are you doing? What are you doing staring at that marble? Just staring at that block of marble. He said, that's not a block of marble. He said, that's an angel just waiting to be freed. 
And then he took his sculpting tools, the chisel and the hammer, and he began to work on that uh, marble block only to see an angel come forth from his hands. I know some of you have a poor identity. You, you struggle with seeing yourself as God really created you. He loves you madly. I mean, uh, it's just amazing how much God loves us. But he loves us so much that he's freeing angels from blocks of marble by trimming and cutting on us and chiseling on us. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, but I want you to know the story's not over and this is not the end. God has so much more for us. I, wanna, I want you to bow your heads with me right quick. And, and I, I, I want you just to um, just somehow get still before God. The worship team's going to come and sing a song. And in just a moment, there are going to be elders and pastors here that want to pray with you because sometimes you've got to recognize the trial. And uh, maybe you need to come kneel at this altar, come to the Lord's Supper, uh, whatever. I, I, I'm just saying it's time to act. But here with your eyes closed and your heads bowed in a holy moment, I want you just to uh, clench your fist. We've done this before, but just... Clench your fist out there in front of you and just let this re, uh, be a symbol of the trials that you're going through right now. Whether it's relational trials or health trials or financial trials or uh, parenting trials, um, whatever your trial may be. And then I want you just to give it to God. Release your hands and say, okay, God, I need you. I need you to bring health to my body. I need you to bring health to my mind. I need you to help me in this relational battle. Father, I just give it to you. I yield to you right now. I, I can't fix it on my own, God. I just yield to you. Father, as these people this morning have released these trials to you, I, I, can't, I can't guarantee that it's going to go away until your uh, complete will is accomplished. I know there's probably someone in this room that's not even a follower of Jesus. They just happen to be here today. And Father, I pray that they understand that we have a God who loves us and has provided all we'll ever need, especially forgiveness and salvation. And anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so, Father, through conviction of their heart, I pray that you'd speak to them right now. But, Father, for the believers in this room, that, Lord, forgive us for being whiners. Forgive us for being complainers. Forgive us for blaming others, Lord, instead of just drawing close to you. So, Father, as we enter into this time of singing, a, Lord, just an incredible song, Run to the Father. Lord, may we run to you right now. In the midst of trials, may we run to you. And some, Lord, let them run to this altar. Let them run for prayer. God, we need you right now. So, Father, we yield to you in Jesus name. Amen. Please stand. Elders and pastors be available for prayer. Let's sing the song Run to the Father. Come. Don't miss this opportunity right now.